In this video, I'm going to walk you through what you need to know about some of the most commonly used ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, how to read them, and how to use them to write names. These are the first hieroglyphic signs that I learned when I was learning Egyptian in graduate school, but you don't need to go to graduate school to learn these signs, just stick with me through this video. Welcome to Voices of Ancient Egypt, where we demystify the words and lives of the ancient Egyptians through animated videos like this one. If you're new here, I'd love to have you subscribe and hit that bell icon so you don't miss future videos like this one. Let's jump right into the three things that you need to know about these hieroglyphic signs in the so-called hieroglyphic alphabet. Number one, some sounds in English and Egyptian were basically the same, but Egyptian also had sounds that English does not. Many of the sounds that these 25 signs can represent are the same or very close to the consonants in English. And it's a popular practice today to write your name in hieroglyphs or have somebody else do it for you. Certainly, when I was a kid, my parents bought me one of those Your Name in Hieroglyphs cartouche necklaces because I loved ancient Egypt. And it was a great gift. I really loved it. I wore it all the time. But when I was a bit older and I first started really studying hieroglyphs myself, I quickly discovered that my necklace did not really spell something that sounded exactly like my name. This is because many people write out these lists of one consonant signs in Egyptian as if they're exactly the same as our modern alphabet. You've probably seen these so-called hieroglyphic alphabet charts around. But this is not entirely correct, which causes most of the writings of modern names in hieroglyphs to really have the wrong combination of signs to represent the sounds in your name. Let's look at an example. Let's say Jane wants to have her name written in hieroglyphs on a ring or a necklace, so she places an order for somebody to do that. She gets back her name spelled like this, with a cobra, an arm, a wavy water line, and a reed leaf. With some further study, Jane discovers that the snake sign is really a great choice for the first sound in her name, as it's basically equivalent to the English J, a J sound. Likewise, the water sign in the third position is basically equivalent to our N, so this is a good choice too. However, she soon discovers that the other two signs aren't quite right. Before moving on to what's wrong with these other two signs, I wanted to let you guys know that I have a free guide on how hieroglyphs work and how to write your name, which includes a full list of these signs that I'm talking about today. So you can head on over to my website, which is linked in the description below, or type in voicesofancientegypt.com slash guide. That's voicesofancientegypt.com slash guide. So hit pause, go grab the guide, and then come back and finish this video. Number two, there are no vowels in Egyptian writing. So you may have noticed earlier that when I mentioned these 25 signs, I said that they represented consonant sounds. And you might have been wondering, what about the vowels? Well, the ancient Egyptians actually did not write the vowels at all, only the consonants. And this may seem strange at first for people who don't use this type of writing system, but it's actually a practice that shows up in other writing systems, such as those of Arabic and Hebrew. And even in English, if you're a native speaker, you probably don't have much trouble reading things where the vowels have been taken out, especially if you've been texting for many years now. So for example, if you see this, you know that this means tomorrow, seriously. And even if you haven't done this, maybe in the past, if you were apartment hunting back when you needed to do that in a newspaper where space was limited, and you saw an apartment described with this phrase, H-D-W-F-L-R-S, you would know that that apartment had hardwood floors. Let's go back to Jane's name in hieroglyphs. Now can you guess what's wrong with the spelling of her name? Let's think about it for a moment. Should there even be four hieroglyphs to spell her name? What sounds are in the name Jane? J, A, N, right? Only three sounds. In English, the final E is not pronounced, it's silent. So there's no reason to add an extra hieroglyph on the end, like the reed leaf, to represent the E. Now, since the ancient Egyptians didn't write vowels, Jane soon realizes that there's actually no equivalent for the E anyway, even if it was pronounced in her name. And no equivalent for the A either. The sign used for the A in her name instead actually indicates a type of laryngeal sound. That is a sound that one makes by tensing the throat while speaking. This letter is called Ein in many related languages, and it sounds something like that first sound in the name Ein. But forgive my English accent on that. So Jane discovers that the spelling of her name in hieroglyphs that we saw before would actually be pronounced something along the lines of Jainya, 
instead of being actually close to her name. And again, if you speak a language that has these sounds in it, please forgive my English speaker's accent. So to actually render Jane's name in more realistic combination of hieroglyphs, I would suggest to use just the cobra and the water sign, the J and the N, because we don't need any vowels. Alternatively, you could actually put the reed leaf in the name, but I wouldn't put it at the end like we saw before. I would put it in the middle. And that's because the reed leaf actually represented a very light Y sound, a very slight Y. And when we say the name Jane in English, we tend to pronounce it with this very slight Y sound just before the N, Jane. So you could use J-I-N or Cobra Reed Leaf Water. However, I should point out that it is common use among Egyptologists to treat the arm and the vulture signs like they are an A in Egyptian. So Jane could still conceivably use the arm for the A in her name if she liked, though it wouldn't be actually exactly equivalent to the Egyptian. Number three, some English sounds did not exist in Egyptian. All right, so let's look at some other examples to see how this part works. In the last video, I showed you my name in hieroglyphs and I promised you a closer look at my name and why I chose the hieroglyphs I did. So that's what I'll do right now. But if you haven't seen the video, there's a link in the description below and in the cards up in the corner. So as you can see here, for the L in my name, I actually use an R. And that's because Egyptian didn't actually have an L sound in the language. And for most of Egyptian history, they used an R or sometimes an N and an R together to substitute for L when they had to write foreign names. Now you've probably seen these hieroglyphic alphabet charts that show a lion as the L sound. And this was used in later Egyptian history, especially when they had to represent this sound in Greek names a lot. But for most of Egyptian history, they didn't do this. So I prefer to stick with using an R to substitute. But of course, for your own name, you can do it whichever way you like. Next, you'll notice that I did not use any hieroglyphs to represent an equivalent for the E and the I in my name. This is of course because of there not being any vowels in Egyptian. Now, since we don't know exactly how most ancient Egyptian words were pronounced, modern Egyptologists do treat the reed leaf as either a Y or a long E sound, and the quail chick as either a W, W, or a long U sound, though they're not actually vowels. And when these weak consonants are not present, Egyptologists insert a short E sound, so like a I, sometimes called a schwa, in between the consonants so that we can say them aloud and understand each other. So since I don't actually have like a Y sound or a W or even these long vowels, it makes more sense just to do that substitution of short vowels. So me, lind, for example, which works totally fine without having to put any hieroglyphs in there. But you probably noticed that I did use the vulture at the end of my name to represent the A. Now, this honestly is a bit more of a stretch in my choices as far as trying to get as close to the Egyptian as possible. I could have just as well left it out and not put anything in that spot because this sign, which we call Aleph, is really not a vowel. It's actually more along the lines of what's called a glottal stop. This is the noise it's made when you clench your throat to stop a sound from coming out. So it's like the sound in the middle of when you say, uh-oh, for example, you, you clench your throat to stop that sound. So this is really not exactly realistically equivalent to the A in my name, of course. I just decided to go with it that way. I like the way it looks. When you do your own name, you can always make these judgment calls yourself as well as to whether to include a sign for an A sound or an A, ah, for example. Let's look at another example. This one's maybe a little bit simpler. The name Rebecca. I would spell it with the mouth hieroglyph for R, the leg for B, and the basket for a K. Now, if we wanted to follow the modern convention, again, of using a vulture or an arm for an A sound, we could do that at the end of this name as well, just like I did in my name. But we could also leave it out if we wanted. Now, because we treat a lack of vowels or weak consonants in a word by using a sort of substituted short E sound, Egyptologists would actually read this aloud just like the way we say the name Rebecca in English. It would just be Rebecca. In addition to the ancient Egyptians not having a sound equivalent for our letter L, they also did not have an exact equivalent for our letter V, the V sound. So if you have this in your name, you'll need to substitute something similar, such as the F or a B, since these are both linguistically similar sounds to V. Let's look at one last Western name example. 
So if we wanted to write the name Wilson, for example, as one would have done through probably most of Egyptian history if they had to render this name, I would do it like this. A quail chick for W, the mouth, which is an R of course, substituting for the L that doesn't exist in Egyptian, a folded cloth for S, and a water for N. And I just wouldn't put anything in for the equivalent of the vowels, since we don't have any weak consonant sounds here. Then there would have to be also one additional sign at the end, which I haven't mentioned yet. That is, a seated man in this case. And you might have noticed for Rebecca and Melinda, we also need a seated woman at the end. These signs are what Egyptologists call determinatives. In essence, they help you categorize a word. In this case, it lets us know that we're dealing with names or some kind of description of a person. Two of them, of course, belonging to women and one to a man. Now, if you haven't seen it already, the previous video in this playlist is all about determinatives. So you can find that in the description below in a link and also in the cards to this video. Let's look at one popular name in ancient Egyptian, the name Seneb. This literally means health or healthy. But if you saw it written like this with the S, N, B, and a seated man determinative, you would know this is actually a man's name, Seneb, rather than being used as an adjective that is a descriptive word describing somebody as being healthy. So what's your name and how would you write it in hieroglyphs? Don't forget to download my free guide and use it to write your name and then come back to me and show me what you got. I can't wait to see your name in hieroglyphs. In this video, I've shown you all examples that read from left to right, just like English. But did you know that you can read and write hieroglyphs actually in the reverse direction or even from top to bottom? So how do you know which direction to read in? Well, that's what you'll learn in the next video, which you can find linked right here. And if it's not out yet, make sure to hit subscribe and that bell so you don't miss it. See you in the next video.